part of the steering committee here, and I, uh, I'm hoping that everybody's enjoying the day and getting a lot out of this. Um, it's time for our next speaker, and I'd like to introduce the two of them. Um, first one is Sam Kennedy, who I have known since I was a volunteer, and he was the consultant at, at uh, um, the campaign we did with Shrine, which is my church. And that was a good 17, 20 years ago. So, <laughs> before the dawn of the current time. So that does attest to how long he's been in the business. He is the president and founder of Strategic Partners Incorporated. His area of specialty includes major gift development, annual endowment and capital projects, and leadership development. He has supervised the raising of over $1 billion in charitable gifts in his career. And he's uh, uh, had 17 years of resource development before he started uh, his company. And his partner, managing partner, Judy Wernett, which I think indicates that you're the one who keeps him in line, has been, <laughs> he's, has been there since 2007 and has 30 years of experience in education, social service, and healthcare organization. She provides executive leadership for hospital, hospitals, veterans organizations, and schools. And uh, if we can give them a warm welcome, they're going to be talking about creating a culture of philanthropy. It is on. Very good. If you can't hear me, say so. Cool. All right. Good morning. Still morning. This, this has been a great morning so far. Uh, I love the, uh, well, I, there are several things I loved early on, but the, the ending of the plenary session with the notion that what we're doing is creating meaning through a process of philanthropy. What a beautiful uh, framework for everything else we do. And we've had, uh, at least in the sessions that I have been in, uh, just some great techniques and strategies and updates on what's going on in the marketplace that have been really important. Uh, what Judy and I are uh, here to share with you is actually a piece that could bring some of this together for some of you. I love the fact that we're doing this before lunch, uh, which by the way, we promise, no kidding. We will have you out of here in time for that. Um, but it will give you a chance to synthesize some of the things that you heard this morning and what we're going to do in the next 53 minutes, and uh, and then, uh, or, you could, or you could have lunch with us. We'll talk more about it. But the uh, the idea of culture, you have an idea that culture is something that changes incrementally, slowly over time. That may be true, but here's some great news. It's also possible for culture to change very quickly. That requires something that we call transformation. We've been hearing about that this morning as well. So we have put those two ideas together. We're going to talk about how culture, your culture, can change and move to the position you think it should be pretty quickly. This is a deep dive on the culture of philanthropy. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a little bit about what it looks like. We're going to turn the tables just a tad and talk about it from a donor perspective instead of our own perspective. And then the last part is we're going to talk, and the last part, by the way, is the best part. So if you scoot early for any reason, come back toward the end, the last part is the best. That part, we're actually going to talk about the uh, way to conduct fundraising in a way that can actually be transformational for donors. And, and that we love a lot. So, uh, here is what it takes to hang with us this morning. Uh, we have guidelines for participation. Uh, you are welcome to participate if you want. Don't have to if you're in the room. That'll be good. We're glad of that. We're gonna we're gonna offer you some things that are somewhat out of the ordinary. Uh, we urge you to try them on. We're only here till 12:30. At which point, you don't have to have any if you don't like it. But there are going to be some things that are going to require some courage, some new ideas, some very different ways of looking at things. Uh, periodically, we will do some things to lighten the mood a little bit. We like using humor in what we do. 
But the, uh, one of the things that drives a lot of our work is curiosity. Uh, out in the world somewhere is the curious bank. We're the curious development folk. And we urge you to join us in that. Dream big. If that's daring for you, this is okay. If we come across things that seem challenging and difficult, and you scowl and you say to yourself, I'm out of here, even if it's before the end, we have a solution to that. And we use this at our clients. We teach our clients three words at the beginning of engagements. And I want to offer this to you. It's very simple. It's give it up. So periodically I might ask you to do that. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. Give it up. Give it up. <laughs> all right, do that one. It's all right. It'll still work. I'm right. going to ask you, though, to give up one other thing, though. You do have two books um, to give away at the end, so I'm going to pass around this, and if you put your business card in here, we'll draw up to that at the end. So while you are doing everything you can to have a great lucky experience with the drawing, we're going to, part one, explore a culture of philanthropy. So, as you might imagine, this has very little to do with getting the next gift in. It has a lot to do with walking hand in hand with your donors. It actually involves changing the entire way that you approach what you're doing and engage everybody, everybody, everyone, everyone in your organization from the, the chair of your board all the way to the people that are working in mop rooms and mop closets. And I urge you to remember, we started this morning with that video clip narrated by Bill Cobbs, where he talked about a, a legacy gift made by a man who was a janitor in a school, and at the end of his life, became one of those donors that we aspire to find. That's transformation, and that's what we're talking about. Big change in a, in a short time. Now, we, are famous, maybe infamous, for using movie clips to illustrate what we're talking about. And today we have time for one, so we pick our, our most favorite, most apt, most pithy, pithy video clip. How many of you are familiar with Pursuit of Happiness? All right, Pursuit of Happiness, great film. In it, Will Smith plays the character, the true story character, Christopher Gardner. Christopher Gardner, when the movie opens here, although he doesn't look like him in this little clip, is homeless. He is living in San Francisco. He has his son in tow. He's got some medical equipment, and if he can sell the medical equipment today, he has a place to sleep tonight and maybe a meal tonight. And he's been at it all morning, and it's toward the middle of the afternoon, they, his, he and his son walk, they are walking, they walk by a little uh, city park and basketball hoop, and so they're going to uh, have a little recreational session, and in it, you're going to see transformation. The good news, and this is the reason we're going to start with this, is because if you think of transformation as something huge, well, it is huge, but if you only think of it that way, I'm going to show you what we call a micro-transformation. And it's actually the way it works. So when, I may even point this out, when Chris reaches back, that is Will Smith reaches back and grabs the fence, watch what happens. Let's see what we go. A GoPro! Uh oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know, you know, uh, it'll probably be about as good as I was. That's kind of the way it works, you know, and I, I, I was below average, you know, so, oh, so you probably ultimately break somewhere around there, you know, so, I really, you'll excel at a lot of things, just not this, so I don't want you out here shooting this ball around all day and night, all right? Don't ever let 
let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it. Period. transformation in this story. This was a good news story and it was a good news film because in it the character that Will is playing actually carried that out in his own life and career. But micro transformation. So one of the things that we learned from Aristotle is the best way to understand something quickly is to be exposed to radical extremes. So what I want to do is take a look at the screen and you will see on one side traditional cultural statements, ways of leading, and on the other side transformational culture, ways of leading. It's very common when I show this to people that there's a, immediately a notion that what's on the left side is bad and what's on the right side is good, not so. Just different. So take a look at that. I don't want to read it to you, but if you look at the left and right, the way that many of us learned our trade, actually the world that many of us grew up in and started our professions in, all of those behaviors, leadership behaviors, were successful at work. There's nothing bad about them. However, they won't produce the kind of results that are necessary if you have in mind changing the culture of your organization. So don't think of it as wrong or right. Think of it as a, uh, a quick review of what the nature of our work is here. And also, uh, take note, well, I was going to say take note of how that affects you personally. So, like this. Everything comes down to your mission. Everything comes down to the mission of your organization. Uh, John Dashinsky, who wrote the book Philanthropy in a Flat World, uh, and you can in the corner of the slide there, said, uh, when you are talking to people and when you are thinking about who you are, and right now I'm talking about your organization, but for extra credit, think about this as who you are personally. Put, these, put this screen through your head. What do you do? Why is it important and urgent? What is it that you do better than anybody else on the planet? Inside our shop, we also have another phrase that we use periodically when we want to make a point. It's a verbal exclamation mark. It's called, no kidding. If I say, no kidding, hear a verbal exclamation mark next to what I said. What do you do better than anyone else on the face of the planet? Who's challenged by that? How does it make the world a better place? Who benefits from the work? How and how do you measure it? I want you to get an idea of the magnitude of those questions. Because that is the world that our donors are living in. And in any discussion of cultural change in the world of philanthropy, we have to be very mindful of the kind of questions that are being asked, the ones that we ask and are asked us. All day long, Judy and I are talking to leaders of organizations and philanthropic leaders in the communities where we work. And every question we get usually starts with, how can we raise more money? We think that's the wrong question. We think the question should be, why are we raising more money? We want to know more about that 
Christine Miller has a book called Bounty. Take a look at that. Christine dives into that pretty deeply. I don't think we have to uh, dwell on the magnitude of this industry. It's a huge number. And the importance of what we do is reflected in the growth, even through the bad times in Southeast Michigan. Uh, look how those numbers ascend. I think we can let that, let that pass. So here is another critical tool in understanding culture. This slide is an illustration of a, of a single process. The top line is a continuum, and the bottom, the same arrow is wrapped around that indicates what happens with repeat donors. But take a look from left to right. Identification on the left and investment on the other side. This is the process by which people make decisions. We're talking about philanthropy, we're talking about money, we're talking about our world. We think of it as, I've never met you, here is a transformational gift. But I also want you to notice that this is the same process that you and I use every day when we're shopping. This is how you buy a refrigerator, or an automobile, or pick a school for yourself, or family members. This is a human decision process. What we like to have people do is think about it this way. On the left, I've never met you. On the right, let's get married. Odds are everybody in this room understands that. And if you follow along and thought of human relationships and the various steps, if you, if you were nuts enough to actually get technical and analytic about that on a subject that you want to be warm and cuddly about instead, by the way, you should stay warm and cuddly. I'm the analyst. I like to get into the nuts and bolts of that. But everything we know about building human relationships personally applies exactly to donors. And if we understand that process, then we are in a position to make our behavior very purposeful when we are working with people. That's one of the keys to transformation. And so you have to work through each one of these in order. You can't skip the steps. So as you're thinking about your donors, you have to think about where they're at on that continuum and think about the strategy. What do I need to be doing with that donor to help build a relationship to move them to the next step? So the next thing, we've been talking a lot about philanthropists this morning, and you've heard the word transactional and transformational. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what is a culture of fundraising versus a culture of philanthropy. Um, again, neither one is good or bad. It's just a different way of doing things. And we talked a lot this morning, Jay talked about what philanthropists are and where they come from. And so from an organizational standpoint, you can put your organization state of attracting more philanthropists than fundraisers, than the, the transactional donations and donors, by doing some of these things. Um, fundraising in a culture of fundraising is about raising money, where in a culture of philanthropy, it's about ensuring resources. They're transactional versus transformational. When we, we talk about transformational, we're talking about, we are talking mainly about transformational for the donor. When the gifts are transformational for the donor. Wonderful things happen, and those gifts become more sustainable than when they're transactional. Um, whether the folks on the checkbook, or whether it's on something that they really care about, whether um, you feel you're begging from a lot of fundraisers, particularly those that are in the organizations, or a lot of board members sometimes feel this way, that you know, they don't like to get involved in the fundraising because they're begging for money. But when you're got, working from a culture of philanthropy, your board members, your volunteers, they want to talk about the return on investment and the impact and sustainability of your organization. Um, there's not usually a fundraising plan and fundraising, and there is a resource development plan when it's um, from philanthropy. Um, one of the big things in, when it's a culture of fundraising is there's a lack of expectation of board giving. And in philanthropy, it's a process where the board members significantly based on their own means and circumstances, financially support the organization. And they want to do that because it's something that they are passionate about. Um, 
and a little, again, we talked about sometimes we're a little shady the organization, the amount of work it does in the community, a lot of smaller social service agencies, we find this in our work, are like, we're just this small little organization over here, we're not really doing a whole lot. But when you're operating from a culture of philanthropy, you really operate from the premise that your organization fills a critical need in the world and in the community. And we're going to get into a little bit more about how you can make your organization a culture of philanthropy. Thanks, Judy. So the, uh, the next part of this, which are nine signs of a strong philanthropic culture, a lot of times when we're talking about this, the uh, people we're talking to want to make this into a, a checklist for their own organization. I invite you to do that, but uh, keep in mind that the slides with all the details on it are in the slide set that you can download or may have already done. Uh, so it's not necessarily to furiously take notes on this next part. But there are nine signs of a philanthropic culture, and they are the, the work of Andrea McManus, who, uh, whose work I recommend to you. She gets it, and she's very good at, at what she does. So, and, and, and it's a little bit whimsical on purpose, okay? Can your board and leadership spell and pronounce philanthropy? <laughs> Wealth is relative, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody, everybody in this room, everybody we encounter, janitor, in that opening video we saw at 8 o'clock this morning. It's a philanthropist. In fact, this is the time to use it for the first time. It's not about the money. It's about what the money can do. Now, periodically I'm going to say that. I want you to add a piece. Okay, which is? For the donor. Okay. What can the money do for the donor? It's not about the money. It's about what the money can do for the donor. I love this group there, it's just loaded with all kinds of reactive <laughs> juice. Okay, be that way. Everybody who gives time and resources can be a philanthropist. And the more you think about everybody that way, the sooner and quicker and closer you will meet that criteria. So, do we understand the difference between fundraising and development and philanthropy? They are not the same. And uh, the way Andrea has defined these things, I think it's very useful. Fundraising is the methodology we use. It's the asking for money, the technique of asking for money. It's great, but it's not the same as development. Development is managing of that process, management of that process. Neither of those things are philanthropy. Philanthropy is the outcome. It's the desired state. And it's usually, in this example, it is carried out by, it is done by, it is part of the donor, not us. I, had a, I worked with a, a client one time whose title was Manager of Philanthropy. That title lasted for about two days. It's how long it took to get new business cards made that said something that was more accurate and would resonate better with donors. Work, by the way. Does anybody in here with a title like that? I would ask you to identify yourself. So one of the things we're talking about, we're not just talking about your office being an office that has a culture of philanthropy. We're talking about organization-wide because every encounter someone has with your organization has an impact on how philanthropic they can be. So, phone rings. And somebody answers the phone and asks for your office or asks for you, what happens? Naturally, you know the answer to that question. Oh, wait, we don't answer our phone. A computer answers our phone. Really? Okay. Strong philanthropic culture. <clears throat> and exactly what is it that the development officer does? Uh, he or she extracts money from people. Does anybody in your shop, not in your shop, does anybody in your organization that thinks that work hard to broaden that definition? It's not what you do. It's not close to what you do. 
and the person on the phone knows how to take care of a caller. This is worth a, a two minute, a one minute. We had a client several years ago where the young lady that answered the phone in the development office was at her station in the door walk a volunteer hospital setting. Well, in the door walked a volunteer. And the volunteer didn't normally work on whatever day of the week it was. Tuesday didn't work on Tuesday, but the volunteer was there. And the volunteer said, I would like to talk to you about a gift. She said, that's the receptionist. I'm sure he was. Receptionist called your boss, related that while the lady was standing there. Boss said, you talk to her. I'll send somebody up to watch the phone. So the bewildered receptionist went into a little conference room with the volunteer and came out with an $18 million check. And I'm not making this up. And the reason that he had her talk to her was because that was where the relationship was. Lady with the check did not know. Director of dancing knew the receptions. Okay. Fourth sign of a strong philanthropic culture. Everybody recognizes the role is not raising money, but is building relationships. I remember a place where I worked, which I will not name, Gene, for your benefit, that. I was getting gooned for being seen regularly walking out of the office with a bag of golf clubs. Now my problem was I should have left them in the car. <laughs> but the folks in the school had, had the idea that all I did was play golf, which is not true. But even if it were true, it's what I should be doing. That's what the donors are. Fifth, you have a written statement of philanthropic values. It'd be fun to ask people to identify that, but I think I won't. But understand this. There are philanthropic values in your organization. Trust me, they are there. Articulate them. Write them down. And make them available. That is one of the tools that gets what those things are more prominent and lets people understand when they come in and just walk around to understand that this is a place where philanthropy Thrives. And those are the models, the uh, code of ethics, the code of bill of rights, those kinds of things, easily available from uh, organizations like AFP, particularly, uh, or AHP, for those of you in the hospital world, are great. So, this function that we do is a necessary evil, according to some. If you come across necessary evil in your organization, then that's one of the signs of philanthropic culture, not evident. This is a poor function. It's long term, it's strategic, it's responsive, it, is tied, it ties you to your community need. Think about this. This is a useful thought. We're sitting here at Schoolcraft College. Anybody in here from Schoolcraft College? Cool, they won't kill me for this. I say Schoolcraft College has absolutely no needs whatsoever. Dot, dot, dot. But the community around here has all kinds of needs. And the students, the potential students, have all kinds of needs. Schoolcraft College is the means by which those needs can be fulfilled with your help. But the Schoolcraft College needs something? No. The people need something. Think about that. That's a philanthropic mindset. And your organization is the vehicle. Be accountable. No kidding. Accountable means reporting on financial results. No question about that. But accountable also means being fully disclosed and fully informative to donors and prospects, the volunteering information, not having information requiring extraction from us, being very, very open, very, very straightforward, telling the truth all the time, no kidding. That's accountable. It also means that when you promise a donor that you're going to take their money and use it for a particular thing, that you actually do that on 
Fortunately, we've run into organizations that have not always done that, which creates problems down the line when they run into that when they're trying to do things for other campaigns. And then communicate what the donor's impact has on, um, as, you know, she had an excellent example of using social media for that. So, 100% of the board makes an annual philanthropic gift. In this room, I'm not going to dwell on that, but I will just reiterate, that's not negotiable. There are no excuses for that under any circumstances, period. Everyone can make a gift within their own means and circumstances. And the last one is that donors and even prospects, as you're working with them, are really viewed as stakeholders in the organization right from the beginning. They are partners with you in the mission. And in fact, they are really the ones that are forwarding that mission because guess what? Your organization has no needs. The people you serve have needs. Okay? Now. So for a minute now, I want to take yourself out of your hat of being um, a representative for your organization and think of the organizations that you personally support. Put yourself in the donor spot at this point. Um, so with transformational generosity, um, it is, I hope that you feel that when you make a gift to someone, that it is transformational for you and that it is doing some good for the organization. Relationships are really the key here. Um, otherwise, it's just a transaction. I can write a check hand it to you, and then I'm gone, something comes in the mail, I read it, decide, I can send it in. So building relationship here is key to transformation generosity. And it's no longer about the receiver, the organization, it's about the donor. And it, generosity creates a new quality of being for the donor. How many of you have been in a room where you have gotten a gift from a donor, and when you left, the happiest person in the room was the donor. You may be really happy that you got a really great gift, but when you can leave the room and they're the happiest one in the room, you've really made a transformational act happen for them in that regard. Um, so what you're wanting to do is you're really wanting to connect to their heart's desire. They talked a little bit earlier about matching the mission. So you know, listening to what it is that they're passionate about and, and truly trying to hear what their heart's desire is. When you can match their heart's desire to something that your organization does, it has such impact and can change so many things for them. And that's where transformational generosity really comes from. And we talked a little bit there about the multiplier effect. They then go talk about what a great experience they had and what great things that they're able to do with friends who have similar interests with them. So again, connecting your hearts. Um, it talked about earlier about saying thank you. Um, it amazes me sometimes as a donor um, how my gifts are sometimes received by some of the organizations I give to. There are three ways that you can um, receive a gift. Um, you can take it for granted, which is the gift comes in, it's like, oh yeah, it's a nice gift, okay. And send out maybe a generic thank you note or sometimes a lot of people don't even we run into situations where they're not sending thank you notes at all or if they happen to have given online they get a real basic formal form you know this is a receipt for your gift and some organizations leave it at that and that um, you can take it with grace and not guilt um, we have run into a couple organizations that we work with where um, they have some donors that really, really love them and really want to help them. But the, the leadership know that those people are you know, barely scraping by. And when the, those donors want to make an extremely generous gift, the organization feels guilty. And they almost, we've been told, no, 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 you can't ask them for a gift. They are, you know, they're, they don't have any money and they're doing the best they can for us. But you almost rob the donor in that case of doing what their heart's desire is. And if they are offering that gift, you need to take it with gratitude and grace and not with guilt. Um, and when you take it with gratitude, you really offer and build that relationship of caring with your donors. Right. Okay. Good news. This is the last 
part. The one I said earlier was the best part. The, uh, the other news is that we're going to zip through this because we're going to honor our time frame. And I, I recommend you to the slide set for the things that we may go quickly over. Some of these uh, have a lot of stuff on them. This, however, is what we're going to do. This is the, the this is a technique that we use, which is preview what's coming, so you know what we're going to talk about, and it won't be a surprise. So we're going to talk about a shift. We'll, be, we'll say more about that and what the process of transformation looks like. We're going to talk about uh, some keys to transformational fundraising, some realities of giving, what flow of resources means, what obstacles mean. That should be easy. Uh, and what uh, the characteristics of generosity and transformation techniques. We're going to talk a little bit about story, and then we're going to talk about team. So, I say, let's do this. Okay? In the twenty fourteen AFB conference in San Antonio. The theme of that conference was shift. And everything they did in San Antonio was designed to just get people just move a little bit. Just get out of where you are long enough to see something a little bit differently. So we love that because that's the first step in a transformational experience. And we suggest to you the difference between a traditional not-for-profit culture and a transformed approach is this shift. An internal focus on, on two priorities and a mindset. The two priorities, of course, are saving our way to prosperity. Let's cut the budget. And how do we survive? And the, the kind of the way of being is always fearful and doubtful. We walk into those kind of organizations every day. Maybe you do too. The transformed approach is exactly the opposite of that. There's still two priorities and a mindset, but the, the priority, they're external. It's marketing, innovation, it's sustainability. And the mindset is love and trust. Did you just say love and trust? Yes, I did. That shift will change everything that happens in your professional experience. So, there are three keys to this. You need to know who you are. That's why the name tags are so important in here. You need to know others. That's why the name tags are also so important, although that's not what I mean in either case. And you need to know how to ask, and we're going to get to that uh, as you go along here. So, earlier, I love it, earlier, eight minutes ago, we were showing you the linear decision-making process, very straightforward, a straight line, uh, that is something we're very familiar with. The process of transformation is completely different from that. It is an entirely different animal. And the, I want to concentrate on, or have you concentrate on the right side of the screen. The, the green boxes down the side represent the specific steps in an act of transformation. It starts with thinking differently. Fear and doubt, gone. Love and trust, in. When you've done that, you can check that one. You need really to know who you are. You have to be willing. You really have to be willing to be who you are. And a lot of us, and I include me in this, are not willing to be who we are most of the time. I have been at this long enough now that I'm perfectly willing to be who I am. I hope you like it, but if you don't, it is who I am. So I won't talk to myself up here, and I'll talk to Judy, and I'll do the same thing in front of donors if it helps. But I'm very comfortable with that, and golly, what a surprise. That makes it work for me. Doing what I do will not make it work for you. Doing what you do will make it work for you. Authenticity and vulnerability are two key things to relate to donors. You have to understand how people work. And although that may seem odd to say that, you seriously mean that. If that linear 
continuum of relationship was something that you hadn't thought of before and you weren't necessarily uh, present to the, the fact that there are some steps in there. And the little internal cues from step to step to step are not something you know about. That's what you want to learn about. When you do that, you will be able to understand the people around you much better. Been there, done that. Let me ask you a question. In your career, it doesn't matter how long you've been at it, have you had 15 years of experience? Or have you had one year of experience 15 times? I ask myself that, although my number is 38. However, it's just as relevant. The value of, of that question is the speed by which you give something up. If it's not working, stop. No kidding. If you're going after this and it's not coming, stop. We'll get to a little bit more help with that. But everything you do is actionable. This is not something that you think about. This is something that you do. Our business is an action verb. If you are not going to see somebody, if you are not typing into a electronic social media communication tool, if you are not on the phone, if you are not engaged with somebody, you may not be doing what you should be doing. This doesn't happen while we sleep. It happens while we're in action. And, and this is probably the, the piece that's most valuable. You have, to, you have to be around people that have done this and see what happens. It's a great and famous story about Howard Schultz, who had retaken the leadership of Starbucks back from the he was chairman of the board, he had hired a president, wasn't working, ended up replacing the president with himself, took the company back, and he realized he had to transform the entire organization quickly and in public. Because by that time it was a publicly held company with 16,000 stores all over the world and they were losing money. Yes? So he says in his book on Yeah, we got a reading list at the end of the slide set. In his book on he talks about getting up one morning, uh, uh, getting some coffee in his hand, and walking next door and knocking on his neighbor's door. Knock, knock. And Mike answered the door, and Howard said, Mike, i got to talk to you about what's going on at Starbucks. And he went in and sat down at Mike's kitchen table and talked about it. Michael, by the way, is Mike Dell. And yes, they have houses next to each other in Hawaii. What you do when you've got an enormous amount of money. But Dell had been through it, and Schultz had it. So he, he got coached by somebody who he knew and trusted who had been through it before. Dell had turned around. And essentially, Mike gave him that list, Schultz did it, the rest is available $4 a cup on every corner. Okay. So, realities of giving, we're going to be uh, intentional here. We've already talked today about emotional and personal and social, it makes people happy, actually produces endorphins. It's an endorphin. I have no idea, but it makes you happy in your bloodstream. Okay, now, resources move. Resources move in a flow. And if you think about an individual gift, then you stop. You go over here and think about an individual gift, then you stop. You go over here and think about an individual and you stop, you'll be at it forever, and each of those linear transactional exchanges will bring in some money, but it will not create transformation. Connecting every one to the next, to the next, to the next. Sometimes when we are in the midst of a campaign, we will take a donor who just made a transformational gift, we'll take them along on a visit to another one that's thinking about it, and the two of them figure it out. Flow of resources. Human connection, I think that's it. Uh, run this through your head, if you will. What blocks resources? What makes it stop? If, if I think things are scarce, if I despair, despair is something I do myself. It's 
not real in the world. I do it. When I, when I find myself doing it, somebody hopefully tells me to give it up. Hopefully I do. Fear of the unknown. The unknown is a little unnerving. But we're all grown up, so we can do it. There's always the notion of fear of rejection. Yes. Your prospects and donors are not trying to reject you. So go out and interact with them. So when you're out creating a relationship with your donors, take a minute, sometime over the course of the day, and figure out which one of these blocks your flow of resources when you're relating to your donors. So, be yourself, be vulnerable, trust people, you be generous. When you sit down at the table with somebody that you're going to talk, you be generous. This is one of the, uh, I was talking this morning with uh, uh, a couple of folks from Salvation Army. One of my mentors was a senior Salvation Army officer and he was involved at the time. This is in early 80s. He was involved in a $52 million campaign which blew my little young, just starting head completely away. $52 million, I said. That's a million dollars a week. And he said, yeah, but that's not the challenge. The challenge is that my job is coming up with a million dollars a week in return in services to those people in return for what they had given the Salvation Army. I've never forgotten that. Be generous. And also be generous with yourself of, of who you are with the person you're talking to. Because that's, you know, you have your own personal relationship with your family and your friends, and you share your pieces of yourself with them. Share pieces of yourself with your donor. They will relate to you better, and then that will start to trust and lead to a longer term relationship. Why don't we run down the story? It's coming up here. That really is the, the best thing. Okay, so earlier we promised you that we were going to talk a little bit about story. The stories, we, we all think of stories in terms of case for support. Let me tell you the story of the great needs of my organization. That's lovely. But don't start there. Start with who you are. Let's have a look at this. So you first have to start when you are starting into a relationship with a donor, the first thing you should do is you should tell a story about yourself, about some challenge maybe you overcame, or why you're involved in the organization. So often we go into our meetings with our donors when we're just first getting to know them, and we'll tell them a story about the founder of the organization, or someone else in the organization. And while those are really great stories, to start off with, you should share, again, as I said, part of yourself, opening yourself up, and then they'll respond to that. So once you've told your story, then you can start to tell the story of us, the story of your organization, and the things that you're doing and your mission. And you want to make sure that you're taking time as you're telling your story to listen to them as they respond, find common interest points. And all of that then kind of leads to the jumping off point of the story of now, which is usually either your annual fund campaign of what it is you're trying to do right now, or if you're a capital campaign, what you're trying to do with that. So there's kind of a whole flow of start with the story of self, talk about the story of us, the organization, and go into the story of now. Okay, we promised that we would, as we got to the end, we would talk about building your team. And there's a series of points on this. And each one involves a point on growth, a point on focus. Let's just look at the points on focus going through. I think that'll serve everybody best. So for example, in who is on your team, what are the best, this is for you to be thinking about, who are the best relationships, who thinks and acts the way you want to have the organization function like, bring those folks in, right? How do you do that? You do that with research, with profiling techniques. Uh, if you, take this one home, if you are not spending 1% of your budget on research, then you may want to think what you're doing. Some organizations spend a lot more than that, but it's very, very critical to a functioning team that's going to be engaged in the work that we talked about doing. Okay. How about that? Okay. So, 
get your team to start thinking about the shift from will you make a gift, yes I will, transactional exchange, to the idea of how can I relate best to the people that are around me, heart to heart. Sometimes you will meet with somebody, ask them for a gift, and instead you're going to talk to them about their cat that just died. And that's what's important to them at that point. What about putting donors in the thick of your team? We have clients who bring major donors into their internal team meetings and sit them at the table. Think about that one. That changes the dynamic a lot. Very, very powerfully and very, very uh, positively. Everybody talks a little differently. So we know the various kinds of things that motivate people to make gifts. Notice that all of that stuff, and I'm going to do this again, all of those are internal to donors. They don't depend on what your campaign is about. They don't depend on how short you are from your goal as you coach you to be That's not a motive. Those are the motives. So it's not about the money. It's about what the money can do to the donor. All right. We heard a little bit earlier about when this this thing is hugely important. We're so often in a mode where someone's talking to us and we're thinking about the next thing that you're going to say instead of actually listening to what the donor is saying. So put yourself in a conscious mode of listening to what your donors are talking about. Be attentive. Be present with your donors. Keep in mind, we're going to close with this. Keep in mind that you're not selling something. You're forming partnerships and mean it. Really, really mean it. So, the question is, we should ask this question, I think it's point Judy. The question is, are you ready? And if you're ready, start. Any fans of Seth Godin in here? Seth Godin is responsible for the last slide. Okay. So, you're going to do a drawing here. Jane, I have you. Come on in. So what we're giving away is a book called Connected for Good. This is a book written by a colleague of ours in Milwaukee. And this is written from the point of view of what philanthropists need to get out of their way to help connect them to missions and organizations that they want to support. And the first one goes to Roger Hull. And the second one goes to George Westerman.